Formula One cars are famously strong, but what does it take to actually destroy one? Well, Alex Albon and the Williams team nearly found out during the Australian Grand Prix at the Albert Park circuit in Melbourne, where in his Williams, he had this enormous crash while lapping the Albert Park circuit in free practice. So severe was the damage to his car that the chassis had to be sent back to the factory in England to undergo repair in time for the Japanese Grand Prix. And that created a major problem for his team because they didn't have a spare chassis prepared at the track. And one of their team's drivers, Logan Sargent, had to sit out the rest of the weekend so Albon could take over his car. But what does it actually mean when we talk about the monocoque, the chassis, the tub, or even the safety cell? Well, all of those descriptions are all about the same part of the car, and that's the part of the car that the driver actually sits in. It's where his seat is, it's where the steering and controls are. And if you're a little bit unkind, you might say it's the bracket that holds all of the other parts of the car together, where the front impact structure attaches to, the engine bolts onto the back, but it also houses the fuel tank and the battery for the hybrid system. So it really is the heart and the core of any Grand Prix car. If the tub of a Formula One car is significantly damaged to the point where it needs a repair, then you're going to be pretty sure that the car is going to need a pretty complete rebuild. Not least because if the tub's been damaged, then most of the car's been dismantled already by the driver. But actually the damage to the tub can be a major task to repair. Formula One car chassis are really, really complicated pieces of composite engineering. They've got layers and layers of carbon fiber sandwiching a honeycomb core. Sometimes it's aluminium, sometimes it's Nomex, sometimes it's other fibers, and sometimes it's different fibers in different parts of the chassis to give different performances and different load paths and load directions for the strength the car actually needs. Then you've got all the suspension inserts, and actually looking at that sort of damage is a a major engineering task in itself because you have to do things like use ultrasound machines to see what's going on inside it. It's not like an old metal chassis where you could take a look and just to see if it's been cracked or anything like that. The cracking and the delamination where the, the sheets of carbon fiber come away from the core, that isn't always immediately apparent. Some teams even just use a 20p piece or a $1 coin if you like and tap it on the bodywork of the car to see if the sound changes. And that is actually a valid way of checking if the chassis is delaminated, because if it starts coming apart on the inside, you'll never know until it fails. So just how damaged can a chassis be before it goes beyond repair? Well, it varies and it depends on the design of the chassis, what part of it has been damaged. In some cases, if it's just a suspension insert, they can be pulled out and glued back in and it is all sort of glued together. And that's what the teams can do. They can fix that at the factory. Occasionally they can fix these parts at the track, but it's less common but it is sometimes the case that a fairly small crash can actually write off a chassis. And this is what we saw from Marcus Ericsson in 2014 at the Hungarian Grand Prix. This fairly small accident wrote off that sh Caterham chassis and it was deemed to be completely beyond repair. Actually, in reality, this chassis was sold on to a private owner who 10 years later has made some repairs to it and is planning to get it back on track, albeit not in Formula One specification. Well, the question now facing the Williams team is, can that chassis be repaired? Well, the engineers have had a look at the monocoque and they believe that, yes, if they got it back to the factory in England, they'll be able to make a repair and get it ready for the next race, which is fortunate. But it does probably mean that even at the next race, Williams won't have a spare car available. However, when we say spare car at the moment, what we tend to refer to is a spare chassis, not a complete spare car. That's not really been allowed in Formula One since about 2008, but it's not like it used to be back in the 90s, where teams had a completely built up, ready to run third car sitting in the garage, and in some cases, even a fourth car. And you couldn't have situations where Martin Brundle, for example, would go flying off the road in Melbourne, destroying his Jordan, splitting it in half, jog back into the pits and jump into the spare car after having a quick word with the doctor and get back out and start the race again. That's no longer permitted, mostly for cost reasons, because it's ridiculous for teams to build that sheer number of cars. And actually the number of chassis each team builds now is significantly reduced as a result. Also as a result of uh, pretty much testing all being banned apart from at the beginning and end of each season. Back in the day, most Formula One teams would build about nine or even 10 monocoques, 10 different chassis 
for the season. Today, the top teams will build about six chassis for both of their drivers to get through the season or fewer because of the cost cap and the fact they just don't need too many. And in this case, Williams has only built two chassis. Three is really considered to be the minimum. You really need that spare chassis in a box at the back of the garage. So situations such as that has befallen Williams this weekend do not repeat themselves. That's what Williams needs to get away from and that's what every other team is prepared for. Now there has been a subtle change to the regulations for the 2024 season. Previously teams were not allowed to build up the spare chassis in any way before they needed it. Well they weren't too happy about that as a collection of teams complained to the FIA a little bit and the rules got changed for this season so they can have a part built up car in the garage they can do a bit more work on the car than they were previously allowed to so it gives them a bit of a head start and that's important because in a situation that Williams find themselves in you can't actually have the the power unit or the gearbox bolted onto the chassis anyway because you don't know which driver is going to be getting into that spare chassis and the gearboxes and power units by regulation are assigned to each driver so if you swap cars you have to also swap the power units and the gearbox and that's not a short time scale process now, when a car has a big shunt out on track, what the teams will immediately be doing, even sometimes as the car is bouncing off the walls, is that they will be assessing the damage to the car to be able to take a look at what work they need to do. And in some cases, you'll even see the mechanics starting to prepare the spare parts as the car is being recovered. And a television shot like this is particularly useful for the team because they're gonna be taking a look at the different components. They'll be saying, which of these bits can we reuse and be able to continue using? Well, there's not a great amount of damage visible on the front wing, but when the team got that back, they saw there was actually a bit more. But the front impact structure, not too damaged, so they can change the wing on that and reuse that. The chassis though, the front suspension is damaged, that's where they start to get the idea that the chassis isn't too good. They'll have looked at the position of the rear wheels and how the car hit the wall. That raises questions about the drive shafts, the rear suspension parts. The gearbox in particular, gearbox casing, gearbox internals, they'll be looking at the loads on the data. But some of the bodywork on the back of the car, the engine cover, it's pretty much untouched. So they'll be assessing that as soon as it comes back, essentially on a non-structural part like the bodywork, they'll give it a quick once over, dust off the gravel dust and put it back in the selection of spares. And this is really important because of the cost cap, teams need to use their components as often as possible. For example, the left front suspension on this car, it didn't hit the wall too hard. So they'll have a little bit of an assessment of that and they may be able to reutilize some significant parts of that. Probably not the steering loads and also because the car was hit on the other side, those loads do transmit through. We saw that's a great effect with Charles Leclerc in qualifying at Monaco a few years ago and he missed out on starting at pole because the car had hit the wall on one side and the team didn't assess the components on the other and that put him out of the Grand Prix because they found the problem when he was driving to the grid. Of course, even before the teams have started to assess what the damage is to the car, their first port of call is to check if the driver is okay. And that's exactly what Williams did in that situation. And they immediately got a response from Alex Albon saying, yeah, he's okay, but he's biffed the car quite significantly. Sorry about that, chaps. And at that moment, when they know their driver's okay, they start assessing the car. However, that's not all that happens. In a big impact like that, there's a G sensor on every single F1 car and a little light will come on on the dashboard and it will certainly have done so on this Williams impact, but you see it quite often through the season. And that means the impact has gone over a certain level and the FIA medical team then want to assess the driver's condition just to check that the driver is fully okay. With all the adrenaline pumping, sometimes a driver might not feel the injury right away. So when that kicks off, they will start studying the data on the driver as well as the impact speed and forces that have gone through the car. And a lot of that data can be recorded through biometric equipment in the driver's gloves. They've been experimenting in the driver's helmet as well. They've got high-speed cameras inside the cockpit and a huge amount of other tools to just be able to see what forces the driver has been experienced to. And then if the FI medical team are happy for the driver to continue with the race weekend, they get an all clear. But if that medical light comes on, the driver must first be given the all clear to continue racing for the rest of the weekend. And you can see a great example of that medical light coming on in this footage of Orlando Norris hitting the wall in Las Vegas. And that meant that as soon as the light came on, even though Norris was completely fine, 
the FI medical team wanted to check him out. And that is all important because the human life is slightly more important than all of the bits and pieces that make up a Formula One car. And even though a Formula One car can take a bit of time to repair and quite a lot of money, the sport can never be too safe.